will be recorded and will be shared in the same way that the first one was. So everyone will have access to it. Um, and just one other note, the next in our series is coming fairly quickly on March 3rd, and we will be sending information around about that soon. So um, with that, I will stop and turn it over to Marina. Thank you, Perrin. Thanks so much for having me. Hi, everybody. My name is Marina Braff. Um, yes, I'm on the West Coast, so there is sunshine and not even a morsel of a chance of it snowing, let alone raining. Um, so I feel for you guys all in weather right now. Um, so I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I have a private practice over in LA where I work a lot with teens and adults dealing with anxiety and depression and as you all I'm sure can imagine this last year, it's been a doozy client wise in terms of everything that people are going through. And so this presentation is meant to encapsulate all of the aspects of grief and loss. So not only just losing a loved one through death, but also just the loss of routines and the loss of milestones, being able to celebrate those. So I hope that regardless of where you're at, if you're really hoping to get something from a personal standpoint or a professional standpoint, that you're able to take things away from this presentation. Um, the other thing that I shared with your group a couple weeks ago when I was presenting is that I worked in an agency similar to the work that you guys are doing. So I know the, the impact that helping and working with people can take on all of you. So I hope that through this presentation, if you're hoping to get something from a professional standpoint, you can also implement it into your personal life. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I want to just take a second and kind of get a sense of how you guys are feeling in the room right now, the Zoom room. Um, so yeah. So what I'm going to have you guys do is in, right, or go into the chat box and just write whatever, how you're feeling, sad, frustrated, hopeful, overwhelmed, just to get a sense of how overall and what the climate is. So, so, yeah, okay. Busy, ditto. Um, let's see what else. Overwhelmed, <laughs> done with COVID, oh, me too. Resilient. Okay. Good for you, Tina. I don't really know if I'm there anymore. <laughs> Tired and hopeful. Hopeful. Okay. Overwhelmed. Lots of overwhelm. Yep. But also lots of hopeful. Good. Give you guys another minute or so. All right, for those of you that are joining, I'm just having you write into the chat and let me know how you guys are, how you're feeling, um, just about life in general. So lots of people are writing hopeful, some of you guys are writing uh, overwhelmed, tired, over it. <laughs> Here's another minute while we're bringing on a few more people to join this party. For those of you that just joined, before I jump into my presentation, I'm just asking that you share a little bit about how you're feeling right now in the chat box. Okay. Tired, frustrated, grateful, hopeful. Ah, that's basically like a summary of everyone. It's lovely. Okay. Hopeful, got it. And we're getting more peeps joining in. Lovely, lovely. All right, for those of you who have just joined, I'm just asking that you write in the chat a little bit about how you're feeling right now. Okay, thanks for putting it in there. It looks like we're getting tired, frustrated, overwhelmed, hopeful, resilient, over COVID. All right. Well, 
I think the one good thing here is that you guys all seem to be on the same page, more or less. Um, there's a lot of consistency in terms of how you guys are feeling. And it, it makes sense, given where we're at with this, what feels like just like a never ending year as opposed to 2020 and 2021 makes sense that a lot of you guys are feeling tired and overwhelmed and we have rounded a corner cases are going down vaccines are coming out so I get the the hopefulness too so before I jump into my slides quick housekeeping things I have all of you guys on mute not because I don't want you to talk but because I don't want to hear any background noise while I'm talking because then I'll get like really distracted and it won't be cute for you guys um, I will have an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions um, at the end of the presentation. So you're more than welcome to write in the chat um, questions as I'm going along. Otherwise, I just won't be able to get to them during the slides. Otherwise, um, you can just hold them until the very end of all of the presentations, all the slides, and then I'll open it up and you guys are able to ask questions at the end via the chat room or just by using your lovely voices. Um, so again, thank you guys so much for joining and I am going to share my screen. Full disclosure, I had to get switched to a computer, a new computer. So let's hope the technology is on my side today. Yeah, fingers crossed. Okay, I think we're good though. So, all right, can you guys all see that? Okay, okay, so we're here today talking about managing grief and loss. For those of you who trickled in towards the end, this presentation is meant to encompass grief and loss as a broad spectrum. So it's not just losing someone um, in the traditional way of death. It's also recognizing the loss that we've all experienced, maybe on a personal level, maybe with our family, so on and so forth. So here's the plan for today. We're gonna take an opportunity to get some perspective on where we're at. We're gonna look at understanding the types of grief. We're gonna look at COVID specific losses, um, identifying the stages of grief, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with, so I'll kind of zoom past that. Um, but then we'll spend some time talking about how to manage grief, how to support others who are grieving. And then I'm gonna finish by showing a really cool um, intervention called the relationship tree that you can use with yourself or your loved ones or your clients. Okay, so let's zoom out, right? I really hate saying this, but we are over 11 months in. We are almost at the one year mark of the world closing down. So just let that seep in for a second. Like I can still remember when the world shut down, I was like, eh, two weeks, maybe three, a month tops. I really underestimated what a beast this was going to be. Um, and I think I shared with you guys last time we all chatted, but you really have to think about like the, the roller coaster we have been on through the last 11 months. So in the very beginning, underestimated it. There was some novelty to being able to stay home. We're like, cool, we can have family time and family dinners and this is gonna be so nice. I'm gonna have a glow up, right? And then we were really just looking forward to the summer. The summer was our next milestone. And then the summer came and we were able to deal because we were able to be outside and things were kind of open and we got to see more people. And it was like, okay, we just got to get to the fall and hopefully the fall things will be better. And let's cross our fingers and toes that things are better because we really don't want to get to the winter when cases are likely to spike because of cold and flu season. And then it all happened in conjunction with the holidays and so on and so forth. So you can see how our emotions have been on this ride of like, just get to this point. Oh no, this point. Oh no, this point. And that is, I think a lot of what is, you know, triggering this cumulative fatigue that I think a lot of you were referencing in the chat. Okay. So no one knows how to live in a pandemic, even though it's been a year and we've adapted a certain way. Uh, we still don't really know what we're doing. We're doing the best we can, of course, but no one knows how to do this the right way. So I say this because I want this to be a reminder to give yourself and others that you come into contact with just some extra grace. 
Um, and then I really, again, want to zoom out and talk about loss and how it can come in many forms. So we do have this loss of loved ones. We do have a loss of our normal routines. I remember those days when you'd go to the office and you'd be able to like get coffee with your colleagues on your breaks. There's also a loss of resources. So our kids don't have their camps. Our kids don't have their teachers and their counselors that maybe they're used to seeing. So there's, there's a lot that, you know, is going into to play with just that. And so I really want to be sure that we address all of that as well. Okay. All right, types of grief. So you guys are all in the mental health field, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time defining each of these, but this is really just an important way for you to recognize that grief doesn't come in one package. So grief is defined as a strong emotion that appears when we face loss, when the lot, whether the loss is of a person or something that's important to us. So there's the anticipatory grief, there's the normal and common grief. Complicated grief is like, you know, the, the loss of someone who maybe was abusive, but you still really felt that love towards them. Delayed grief is when, you know, someone passes and you kind of like bounce back. And then six months later, you're like, oh my God, I never experienced that. Um, exaggerated grief is just really intense, sustained symptoms of the grief where, you know, it can really trickle into the major depression. Whereas absent grief, you're kind of looking at that person going like, Hey, like checking in, have you, have you really felt this yet? And a lot of times when people are in that absent grief, it's because they haven't progressed through the stages of grief, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, so we have all that. We have all these different titles of grief, types of grief, but underneath all of that, those various forms of grief can happen as, a, as direct results of different types. So like I said in the beginning, loss comes in a lot of forms. And so I wanna really call out the types of grief and loss that seem to be happening as a direct result of COVID, right? So we have job loss where, you know, maybe our partners, you guys are all obviously on, obviously on this call. So you guys have your jobs. Yay. Um, but, you know, our partners may have experienced job loss. Our family may have lost their jobs and they're stressing out. And that can lead into this financial grieving of like, oh, like I remember when I was feeling secure about my finances, when I was really saving a lot, when I felt like I didn't have to worry. And now a lot of people, especially those that are, you know, working in small businesses and, and other impacted industries are really grieving their finances, which, you know, if you think about it, it's like, what? That's so weird. But just like people, just like relationships, losing something stings and it has an impact. There's, of course, the loss of loved ones, and I'm sure you guys are seeing that, again, both on a personal and professional level, and the loss of loved ones, it has a ripple effect, and so even if you haven't directly lost a loved one, perhaps you're just hearing about how others have lost their loved ones, and, you know, I don't have to give you guys a lecture on secondary trauma because you guys know that, but when you're hearing time and time and time again, whether it's within the news or within your industry or your community, oh, oh, here we go. Um, whether it's within your industry or your community, when you're constantly hearing about death, it takes a toll on your mental health. Okay. And then there's the other things that I'm hearing about constantly in my practice, which is this loss of milestones or these loss of celebration. So again, we've been in this for almost a year. I think just about everyone, unless you're born within this month that's coming up, has experienced a COVID birthday. Pretty weird, right? Um, a lot of people have, you know, missed out on their high school graduations. Um, they've missed out on proms. They've missed out on, you know, maybe they got a promotion at work and now like, you know, they would normally want to go out with their colleagues and celebrate and they can't. And we're really seeing this a lot with kids. And again, I work a lot with teens, so I could give examples of the losses that kids have experienced until I'm blue in the face. But really recognizing that this is something that has to be grieved as well, because 
even though we've adapted to this world, this still is not normal. And if we just go on and on about our day, like, oh yeah, like didn't really have my graduation, didn't walk across the stage or yeah, you know, I haven't seen my family for like a year, but you know, such is life. Then we're not allowing ourselves to feel those emotions that often comes with it. And then lastly, I wanted to put in the loss of independence. And that's especially for people who have older family members who maybe are completely and understandably terrified of leaving the home. So they're relying on people other, other than themselves. And they're feeling like they just lost their independence this last year. They're, they're dependent on other people. They're dependent on Instacart or you, know, you guys who are really having to come in and support them. But you can imagine how as you're getting older and you're really wanting to do as many things as you possibly can and then this hits and you're reminded of your age constantly, it, it feels crummy. And, you know, same for like our college kids who have had to come home in the midst of their college experience because classes are shut down and why are they going to pay for rent? And that's another way in which your independence gets taken from you. So again, I just wanted to start with this slide because it just really highlights the impact of the different types of loss that we might all be experiencing right now. Okay, stages of grief. Again, I'm not gonna go into all of the, the details of this because you guys know, but the, the what I really want to emphasize here is grief is not linear. And I think we saw that when we saw the different types of grief that there are, like, you know, there's the delayed grief, there's the exaggerated grief. If grief was linear, there would just be one type of grief, right? Um, but I've had clients come to me saying like, you know, my grandma passed away because of COVID and like, I really feel like I should be sad now. And I am not, I'm not sad. I'm kind of not really feeling anything. And what's wrong with me? Nothing, nothing's wrong. Grief isn't going to follow a formula. It's not going to be step one, step two, step three. But so often we think about these stages of grief as if like, okay, first I'm going to go through denial, then I'm going to get a little angry, and then I'm going to try to bargain my way out of it. And it's not always the case. And so if you have these expectations for how you're supposed to be grieving, and then you're not going through the motions that way, then you're going to start beating yourself up on how come you're not grieving the right way, which if you're already grieving, that's like the last thing you need is to be doing that on top of having to go through all of the feelings that you're feeling. <sighs> it could just be a messy situation. So, um, it's gonna come in waves. That's what I tell my clients. It comes in waves. You know, you're one day feeling really sad and like you're missing that person, you're missing your old life, you're missing your office, whatever it is. And then you have days where you're like, you know what? I'm crushing this COVID life. I've got this. I have a new routine. I like being home. I'm cooking more, whatever it is. Um, that's okay. This is normal. Feelings are going to be fluid. And because of that, the way that you're dealing with grief is going to be fluid. Um, the other thing that I want to really highlight is that when looking at these stages of grief, they can repeat. So people think, okay, I'm going to go through denial, then I'm going to be done with denial. Yeah, not so much. Or I'm going to really get depressed and then I'm going to get to acceptance. And then once I'm at acceptance, woohoo, home free. No. So just like these feelings can come in waves, you can kind of ripple through and bounce back and forth between these stages of grief. So if we're working with clients and even if we ourselves are feeling like we're in these different stages, I really want to emphasize that just because you're at one stage now doesn't mean you're going to the next step next. You can go backwards and that's okay. That's kind of to be expected, but a lot of people don't talk about that. So again, when that happens, they're like, oh my God, I'm regressing what's wrong with me. Marina, yeah. I'm sorry, just a quick note and I apologize yeah. for the interruption. I just wanted yeah. to note that as an agency, Children's Aid definitely is in the mental health field among others, but also that not everyone who works at Children's Aid has been trained in mental health. I think mm -hmm. we're probably collectively more familiar with this than mm -hmm. 
others in like a financial firm or a law firm or whatever. So just folks, if there are any questions for Marina as she goes through these things, please don't forget them and hang on to them or throw them in the chat and we can loop back to them. Awesome, yes, thank you. All right. Okay, well, this is good. Goes right after what your comment said. So this is how I'm gonna break down the grief and how you guys can really recognize it if you're not super familiar with it. So grief looks when you're in the thick of it, when you're feeling the sadness, when you're feeling this isolation and not really wanting to be engaged, it looks a lot like depression. So depression, the classic symptoms are you're withdrawing from your friends and your family because a lot of times you just don't feel like you have the energy to do the things that you used to want to do. And you also have this sense that, oh, you know, I'm so depressed and I'm just not a lot of fun. And I don't want to be around my people because I don't want to be a burden to others. Right. Um, so you may notice like if you if you and or if someone, you know, is grieving a loss, they may not be as quick to respond to your calls or quick to respond to your messages or really wanting to see you because they're just in the thick of it. There's also going to be a change in like the basics. And when I say the basics, I'm referencing your sleep, your hygiene, and your nutrition. So when you're feeling depressed, again, your energy is squashed. And so doing things that we're kind of able to do on this automatic perspective, this automatic way, it, it goes out the window. So a lot of times people who are struggling with depression or who are in the thick of their bereavement, they're sleeping a lot because being awake feels too painful or they're not sleeping at all because they just have these constant ruminating thoughts depending on where they're at in the stages of grief. Their hygiene is off, you know, like they're not really wanting to shower. They're not feeling like they need to take care of themselves. I had a client who told me like, yeah, I, when I'm really depressed, I just don't shower because like, I just don't feel like I deserve to feel that good feeling. And so it sounds super sad, but that's also kind of where people are at when they're in the thick of it. They, they're feeling undeserving and just kind of not themselves. And when you're feeling not themselves, you're not wanting to eat like normal. Your, your nutrition is off. So you're either overeating or you're under eating. Okay. Um, these are really helpful things like the basics, recognizing the basics. If you're worrying about something happening with someone in your home, these are super easy things to spot because it's, again, it's everyday things. So if you're noticing your kid is sleeping too much or sleeping way more than normal, or their eating has changed, that's like a little red flag indicator. Um, the other piece again, is it's a lack of enjoyment and things you once enjoyed. And kind of going back to my client example, a lot of people just feel like they don't deserve it. And after losing someone, the common thing is, is I don't, I don't deserve to feel happy. I shouldn't feel happy after I've lost someone. Like I, I need to stay in this sadness um, and kind of taking it full spectrum to, you know, COVID life. I think a lot of people feel like they can't do anything fun because this world is shut down and the world is struggling. And so, no, no, they have to be in this stressed out place because that's where a lot of people are and most people are. Um, sadness and crying spells. I'm sure we've all had our breakdowns throughout this COVID situation where we're crying more than usual, where our emotions are kind of on the fritz. Um, that's to be expected. And there's this lack of energy. And you guys referenced that when you were all saying, I'm so tired and I'm so overwhelmed. And the, so those are all pieces where you could say someone's depressed versus someone's just grieving. So the big differentiating factor here is that the, the symptoms associated with grief are going to be a result of a specific loss. So if you're experiencing all of these symptoms, the withdrawal and the change in sleep and all of that right after somebody has passed or you know, you've lost your job, or you're struggling financially, and you're feeling this for three to six months, that's bereavement. That's bereavement disorder. It's actually in the DSM, which is you know the diagnostic Bible for us. Um, versus major depression, that is going to be looking at having these symptoms for two years. So a lot of times people will say, like, Marina, how do I know if I'm like full-on depressed? 
Or how do I know if I'm just sad from losing someone or losing something? Pets are a big one. A lot of people feel like they shouldn't feel sad if they lost a pet. No, that's not accurate. That's really devastating. But I always go back to how much time has gone by since you've lost whatever it is that you've lost. And that's going to give you a better indicator of, you know, are you depressed or are you grieving? Okay, so how do we manage grief? And this slide is really directed at how we're managing it as if we're the ones who are grieving, right? The next slide will address how to help others. But this one is if we're in a state of grief, if we are dealing with loss in some form, there are certain things that just kind of serve as a foundation of guidance that I provide clients. So the first thing, and sometimes which can be the hardest, is just naming and acknowledging your feelings. When we're feeling sad, we oftentimes want to deny that. We don't really want to own that we're feeling sad. But if we can name that emotion, it's like name it to tame it, right? So if we can name the emotion that we're feeling sad, then we can be thinking about things that are going to really help us feel better and come up with things that are going to really maybe lift our spirits even for a moment, if not, you know, an hour or all day. Um, then, and the other piece too, why the naming can be tricky is that a lot of times when you're dealing with grief, you have two emotions. So you've got this sadness, but maybe you have joy watching your kids laugh or you have sadness, but you're really doing well in work. And so it, it like hurts our brain to think like, can I have both? And yes, you can have both. You're allowed to have both. It's normal to have both, but you do want to be aware of that. And if you're feeling bad about feeling good, you also want to recognize that dynamic that's going on. So you can kind of excuse the guilt out of the way if you're feeling good. Okay, the next piece is to lean on your support system. And so it's really important to recognize who our support system is and who we feel most comfortable going to in times when we're struggling, right? There's going to be people that you feel like you can definitely cry in front of and other people where you're like, no way. Know the people that you can in both situations. The other thing is to access additional resources. So therapy and group therapy. Both are super beneficial. Group therapy is going to be best if you are in a place where you're able to either actively participate or you're open to hearing about others' experiences. A lot of times clients will want to go to a group therapy session right at loss, like immediately following. And I always say like, it's kind of too soon because you're too raw and hearing other people's loss might trigger you a little bit more. Um, so you want to make sure you're in a position where you, you can kind of create that compartmentalization between yourself and others so that you don't get more traumatized. Um, the other piece is to utilize your coping skills and to know like, you know, what are the coping skills you have and are they applicable to any emotion that you're feeling? Like if, if you're feeling sad, mad, angry, do you always go for a walk? If you're feeling sad is a bubble bath better. If you're feeling angry is a run better, really think about yourself and know what skills are most helpful and beneficial when during each situation. Okay. And then the next thing is, is with the loss that you've experienced, you want to honor it. And every person is going to do this differently, whether it's through a religious ritual, um, a family tradition, but you want to think about ways that you can honor the loss because if you don't, there's this lack of closure that kind of leaves this residue inside of us that can add to the the sadness or the anger or just this overall feeling of discontentment. Um, so I've had clients who, you know, will bake the favorite cookie or bake the recipe of someone who passed away or someone who, um, you know, wrote a letter to the person that passed and, you know, put that away. And that was their final closing comments. Um, there's lots of different things to do. And the relationship tree that I'm going to show you in a couple of slides is going to be another example of ways that you can kind of help to process all of it. And then lastly, and kind of most importantly, is 
in naming and knowing your feelings, I also want you to think about how to communicate your needs to the people around you. And every person is going to be different. Some people are going to feel like they need to process by being alone. And so it's telling your partner or your family, hey, I love you guys, but like, I really need some me time. So I'll be back in an hour or so versus other people are going to be like, no, no, I need my family around me. I need to feel connected. I need to feel engaged. And you really want to communicate that to the people in your immediate circle, because the other piece of it is, is, and we'll get to this next, we'll get to it more in the next slide that the people who haven't experienced the grief and loss directly, they don't really know how to help as much and they don't really know what it is that you need. And so they kind of like tiptoe and all they probably want is for you to be like, I just need this because then they can do it and then they can feel like they're really helping you. So never feel like communicating your needs is selfish. It's really helpful for everyone that's in your direct orbit. Oops. Okay. So the next one is how to support others. And so the first thing that I have on here is listen, because I think a lot of times we hear people, but we don't listen. And if we listen just to listen, then we're going to hear what it is that they need, even if they're not explicitly saying it. So if someone is going through, you know, the loss of a loved one, and they're just like, I just can't believe it. I really can't wrap my mind around this. I really just need to do something to, you know, make me feel more connected to them. It's like, oh, okay. They need some kind of a closure thing, or they need to honor them in some way. But you're only going to really hear that if you're listening to just listen to them, okay? Um, the next thing is be authentic. So I have avoid platitudes because this has been a thing where for the last however many years of my life has been a struggle. Whenever someone passes away, I never know what to say because I don't wanna just say, I'm sorry for your loss because that feels like a platitude. And if I put myself on the receiving end of it, it doesn't feel super genuine. And so a lot of times I find myself saying like, I can't even imagine how you're feeling right now. I am so incredibly sorry. Is there anything I can do? And recognizing that you may not understand what that person is going through and telling them that is going to make them feel better than you kind of putting on this, like, I'm so sorry, like, this is brutal and trying to make them feel like you understand if you really don't understand. If you do, if you have experienced a loss similarly, then that, you know, that's different, but really just recognizing where you're coming from and your support is gonna be really helpful. Um, no need to try and fix things. So again, like this is why, you know, if you're the person who has lost someone, why communicating what it is that you need is so helpful because when we see others in pain, we wanna take away the pain, we wanna fix things, we wanna do something. But if you're just going around like, okay, let me make you dinner and let me clean up your room and let me do all these things and they haven't asked for any of that, they may be like, oh, but I just wanted you to sit with me. So don't fix things unless they say, I need you to do this. And that's where, you know, asking what they need really comes into play. So hopefully they're able to say that, but if they're not able to say what it is that they need, ask them, you know, what is it that I can do to help you big or small and, you know, give them the space to really share that. And then refer them to the additional resources. So therapy, group therapy, a psychiatrist, if you feel like medication might be helpful. I mean, you guys don't have to make those calls a lot of the times, but just being aware that those additional resources are out there and checking in with them to see if you know they need anything else other than what you and their loved ones can provide. Okay, okay. All right, we've made it. This is my last two slides and then I will open it up for Q and A. So I'm gonna show you an image of this in this next slide. It's really pixelated, so I apologize in advance, but the relationship tree is, it is a therapeutic exercise. And so, yes, you can obviously do this on your own or with someone you know, but it is most effective and probably most therapeutic and contained if you're doing it alongside a clinician. And hey, if you're the clinician, take it away. 
Um, but the, the point of this relationship tree is it's allowing people to feel the different emotions in relation to someone they lost. And so the green, yellow, and brown, they're the colors of the leaves. You draw a tree and then you draw leaves and you're gonna color code the leaves depending on different memories. So the green would be like anything positive. So, you know, her laugh was so great. So you, you write in her laugh and you color in that green leaf. Um, you know, her, her cookies were green, right? And so basically you get this full tree and then the yellow would be things that were like a little bit mixed. So, you know, maybe she wasn't always really attentive or you wished you had had more time with her or you guys get the point. And then brown is gonna be anything negative. So that's supposed to be like this, you know, dying leaf. Um, but negative would be like the drinking problem or if there was abuse or if there was any neglect. And the, the way that this ends up looking is you have this tree that's filled with different colors and it's so powerful doing this because it makes the client feel like it's okay to have all of these different colors, to have these different memories. So often when someone passes, we think that we just have to remember the good and that we have to put them up on this pedestal because they're gone now. But that's not honoring the truth of the loss. No one is perfect. There's yellow and brown leaves for everyone. And so this is just a really nice way of externalizing it. So you're not making the person say it out loud because sometimes saying it out loud feels like, yikes you're having them put it on tape. You're having them use colors. It's a tangible exercise. It's a lot less threatening than having a dialogue about like, well, tell me the good things about them. Tell me the not so good. Tell me the really bad. So the image, like I said, really bad image. Um, I'll send a picture of this. So you guys can have like a little bit of an example when I send over the recording. Um, this isn't in color anyway, but you know, it's things like her sense of humor was great and her perfume was lovely and her smile was all green, but then the alcoholism was brown. So this is just, again, it's a nice way of also creating closure if people are having mixed emotions about a loss, okay? All right. Okay, I'll leave up my information if you have any questions. Um, and then I think I was seeing, we'll stop sharing this. I think I was seeing some chat stuff going on. I'm gonna switch over to that. Um, okay. All right, so opening up to Q&A. So Tina shared information, EAP. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, EAP is a great program because it's provided for the company and really helps um, employees access all of that and process things as well if they don't have a therapist that they can use directly. So thanks for sharing. Um, so now I'm here, I'm yours. You guys can ask me questions. You can either write them in the chat or simply unmute yourself. I have a question, just, you know, a comment when you put down the five stages of grief and I have wrote down, I'm on my fifth stage. But I also still find myself going back and forth. I lost my mom April of 2020. It wasn't to COVID. I pray that it wasn't. Um, it was a natural cause that she was 92 years old. Um, I just want to know, um, I, I feel kind of happy that she's not around due to everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And there are times I feel guilty because I feel that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just like I was talking to my husband this morning, because we just found out my father-in-law now just got admitted last night. And now we're worried, is it COVID or not? Because mm -hmm. it didn't like this breathing. He went for a physical and now we're dealing with this. Mm -hmm. So I'm like saying, okay, I just accepted my mom's loss. Now I'm getting emotional about my father-in-law. What is this? Normal. <laughs> you know, I think the, the piece about your mom, about feeling like you're in this stage five and feeling this sense of relief, 
it, that's completely normal, especially if she lived to be in her 90s. You know, she lived a really full life. Yeah. And, you know, and so now you're in a position where this has been going on with COVID for almost a year. And you're probably imagining like how challenging it would have been to be taking care of her to make sure she had everything that she needed. So, of course, there's relief there. And that doesn't make you a bad person person a bad daughter at all it's it's just recognizing like oh yeah like you know she went when it was her time and I'm I'm glad she did because you know mm-hmm. she was able to not have to deal with all this and for your father-in-law like the emotions are because you're scared and because you're worried and because he's in physical pain perhaps you know like you're you love him and so the what is this is it's it's the love and the caring and the sadness and the concern yeah because we got caught off guard yesterday um he just went for a physical like he does every month due to that he had open heart surgery Mm -hmm. and they didn't like what and we've been keeping our distant because Mm -hmm. of the age Mm -hmm. um and even when we do see him of course we wear a mask we do everything else um Mm -hmm. But now we're concerned, so we're waiting for the results. Mm. And he's been, you know, he's been keeping his distance as well, doing what he has to do, wear his mask and all that. Mm-hmm. You know, doctor says so far, just, you know, so far everything is coming back negative, but we're still waiting on the results of COVID now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it sounds like there's also some fear that it is COVID and how did he get it and what happened? Right. That's what we're thinking. Like he's been home, you know, we've been doing a lot for them, you know. I mean, I've been in a family for almost 37 years. So it's like my dad as well. You know, I lost, you know, and then I had lost my three brothers to cancer. That's why my mom went into dementia and that happened. So it's been one obstacle after the next. And then we get this news last night. So we were rushing, which we, they didn't let us up into the hospital anyway. You know, my sister-in-law was able to get on by saying we need the keys to move the car. So at least one of them was able to get to see him. And they said, you know, and she got to say, look, he looks good. He's a little scared. He's also nervous. Mm. I was just um, like, okay, what is next? We just, all the time we think that we have a little break in between something else kicks in because my mom died the eighth. Five days later, I lost my son-in-law, 43 years old. Okay. And he had just married our grand, you know, my granddaughter literally performed the whole ceremony and everything for him to pass four months later. So that was another hit. And, you know, again, I got comfortable. We were okay. Just, just this past week during Valentine's day, I was like, Oh my God, honey, I feel good. I feel better. I've accepted. And then we get this news last night. Yeah. So it's like I'm going back into a roller, an emotional roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're on that emotional roller coaster, it it sounds to me like you haven't had an opportunity to really like come up for air. Bad pun, but like that's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you're just like treading water, like frantically, and you're not able to to rest. And it is exhausting. Shavar, you wrote emotionally drained. Yeah, you're tapped. You know, you're at your tilt point and 150,000% understandably so. So I think that, you know, you really have to think about, okay, yes, there are these logistics and you want to make sure you're getting all this information about your father-in-law, but you also want to be equally cognizant of making sure that you're doing what you need to do to take care of you and take care of your husband. Because you know, you guys, it sounds like you guys are an anchor right now. And you yeah, know, and we also concerned because my husband has a heart condition as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, okay, you know? oh. okay. So I'm like saying, I need you to calm down because we're gonna have two. We can't, I can't, right. I can't. And so well, that's another piece though. Like yeah. you're taking care of him and you're trying to manage your father-in-law. So as, as emotionally draining as all of this is, like, I just want to encourage you to think about like, okay, what are, what are even super small things that you can do to try to give yourself a moment, like a little bit of rest, but you're not getting enough. I do. Yeah. I meditate every morning right after I get up. (laughs) It's something I learned by working home these nine months. Right. Um, I do meditate every morning and then I I started soft music. I started walking. Um, Our school is closed now, but I am looking forward to going back Monday. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. a huge distraction for me because I feel that I got to care for the kids. So that's, Mm -hmm. I feel so good when I do that. So I need to get back. Even though I I do my 
my um my virtual sessions with them and everything, but they really like the face-to-face -face and so do I. So I'm really looking forward to going back on Monday. I just don't want to hear anything else from tonight, tomorrow, Saturday, or Sunday. Good. That's how Good. I'm feeling. I'm looking so forward to So you have things to look forward to. That's yeah, it. Yes, I okay. do. <laughs> right. And it looking sounds like the kids it. love you and need you too. Oh so. yeah, they do. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we that. do games and everything. Just this week, I was helping one of the kids put up the lights. Okay, you got to go this way. Okay, now that way. So that <laughs> took a lot that I enjoyed, Good. you know, Good. so, but I'm saying virtually, but we're doing it, we're doing it, <laughs> we're making the best out, out of it. Good. Thank you so much, guys, of thank course. you. Of course, of course, thanks for sharing. Any other questions or comments for me, for your peers? Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned how help, like trying to help other people if you're also grieving, it's maybe triggering and it's hard to do. But what if you're in a situation where like that person may not have someone else? And so you both are like struggling. So how can you like support someone who's also grieving? So like um, you're grieving and the other yeah, person is grieving? Yeah, both of you are grieving and without triggering yourself way into like major depression and also like trying to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really, you know, there's a there's a beauty in that in a way because you guys are kind of both in something together you know you're kind of going through a shared experience together and then you know being mindful of when you're talking with them or you're going to see them or work with them or whatever like thinking about like okay what is my intention now like is my intention in calling them to talk about my own stressors and my own pain or is it to check in on them and see how they're feeling and what it is that they need and really be aware of that because what happens a lot is we go into like this like helper mentality of like okay I'm gonna call them and I'm gonna check in on them and like I'm fine I'm fine everything's fine but then if you're not aware of like oh, like today I'm feeling really sad. Today I'm feeling really vulnerable. Today's, today's rough. And then you get on that call, not knowing where you're at, then they can start talking and then you get triggered because they say something you're like, whoa, wasn't ready for that. And then the roles flip and then they're consoling you when you were trying to console them. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for me? I think just, the hardest part of the COVID um, is not having a proper goodbye. You know, um, I come from a very big family and tradition is everything for us. Um, I have, you know, well over 55 first cousins. Um, when we have um, funerals uh, and wakes it goes on for weeks and mm -hmm. you know losing like my uncle in May of last year um, who was sort of like a big patriarch in the family and not being able to have a proper funeral mm -hmm. or um, even the services were virtual um, and now his memorial service is coming up in March and we're still with the COVID and we're back to probably doing a very, you know, small memorial for a huge family. And again, we're going back to the Zoom, you know, memorial service. Just having the lack of the, the services, the tradition and the culture that we're used to, not having a proper goodbye, knowing that loved ones passed away alone in the hospital or the nursing facility. Um, that I think has also added to so much of the grief Mm -hmm. is wondering what their last moments were like and what were they thinking and you know was someone holding their hand and it's 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 definitely been rough yeah on that front think, too. yeah that is heartbreaking to think about that and and it adds to this you know lack of closure you know a lot of times we are able to be around our loved ones as they're passing and we are able to come together with our families right after and that helps that physical presence of people helps us process things and so the fact that we've had to grieve and you know do these services virtually it's just it just sucks like yeah. it it's not it's not even close to ideal and i think you know, a lot of people that I know who have experienced that, you know, they've gone through the prayers that are part of their religion and, you know, the, the numerous days of, you know, after the loss, and they're also still planning on, you know, having some kind of 
memorial when things are able to open up and so if march doesn't happen for your family like you guys can still do a virtual recognition and then have something later when things yeah. are safer yeah absolutely yeah. yeah thank you welcome that's that's what we're doing we're waiting yeah i i, I ended tina yes I, we're the same way. Huge, huge event. Couldn't do anything for my mom. Not, not even dress her. My that was how sad it was. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to do it. I'm telling her she didn't die of COVID, but they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I understand. So we're waiting. We're doing the same thing. We're going to wait because a lot of us want to get together. Yeah. 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 So I good. understand, Miss Tina. I understand. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Marina, I just wanted to thank you for the reminder that it how, of how confusing it can feel to have two or multiple emotions at once, which is how I've been feeling a lot in the last year, especially. It's like there's just this emotional whiplash in any moment. You feel this layers of emotions. Should I feel this way? You know, how is this grief or loss compared to what I know is the greater grief and loss out in the community, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's very confusing sometimes to even tr understand all, everything that's kind of ricocheting in my body in one moment. So thank you for that reminder. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, unless there are any other questions, I will let you all go and this recording will be made available um, so you guys can go back and reference it if you need to. Um, Marina, I just really want to thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, did Michelle, I did, did you want to? Yes. Yeah, sure, um, go for it. I was wondering about, I, I know you're working with teens and young adults who were saying, mm -hmm. so there were a lot of, you know, graduates in 2020 and I felt truly like terrible for them because I graduated from college in 2019. And mm -hmm. so when the 2020 happened and I'm like, that is so tragic to be like, I just graduated from college for the first time on the first generation, like, mm -hmm. and they can't, they can't go and like cross the stage. They can't yeah. bring their family. Like that's tragic. And so yeah. I was wondering about like the teens or the, the people we may uh, deal with how, does that make their, does that diminish their like sense of accomplishments? Because at that point you're like, oh, I graduated, but like, it like didn't really happen. Like they have to mm -hmm. keep going. So like, how did yeah, that? I think what I had my clients do um, was like, I had them do a lot of reflection towards the end of the year of really thinking about what the last four years were like and what you know their greatest moments were, their most challenging moments, to really give themselves a moment to pause and recognize all that they've done to get to that point um, and to still find a way to make it feel celebratory, even if it just is with their family, even if it just is with like two or three friends, doing something to commemorate it because it is a big deal, high school or college, it's a huge deal. And so just, you know, trying to, you know, wave past it doesn't do any good and it's not fair to them. And it's not even fair to their parents too, who have also sacrificed during those four years, right? So really getting them to think outside the box. And I've been so impressed with my teens and their creative ideas to make it feel exciting still even if they're not able to walk across this grand stage and throw their cap in the air with all their classmates so just letting them reflect on it yeah. well thank you again um this is our last webinar with marina she was with us for the first one and this one so thank you marina and um Nancy and CHI are going to be bringing us um, different facilitators uh, in March and April, and so we look forward to those. But thank you, everyone who joined us. As Marina and I both said, this is going to be recorded and made available, so if any of your colleagues weren't able to join us, please let them know that they will have access to it. And um, we're just really grateful to uh, have this moment to just acknowledge how challenging this year has been and all the different pieces that we're all managing personally and professionally. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks guys. Thank you. Take thank care you. of yourselves.